Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X research and professional physicist. And today I'd like to bring to you another one of my articles. This one is entitled Hurricane Florence, Tidal Event and Gravity Waves. Now in article 343 entitled Hurricane Florence, cover up for tidal force from object in outer space. I showed that since the storm surge is predicted to go along with Hurricane Florence reaching shore were based on it being a much stronger hurricane than it actually was, as it was initially predicted to reach shore as a category three, but it turned out to only be a category one when it reached shore. So the winds Florence generated were much lower than had at first been predicted. But the storm surge prediction was never revised down and was in fact confirmed to be even higher than initially predicted. This indicated that there was no connection between the wind speed for this hurricane and the storm surge and that the hurricane was a cover for an object from space affecting the earth gravitationally. And here you see someone from uh, the Weather Channel stating that a storm surge of 7 to 11 feet uh, had been verified at New Bern. Now the deception was however even worse and was well documented by the YouTube channel In Truth by Grace in a video entitled Florence Update 9-14 and thank you for those people who pointed me to this channel and she shows that m meteorologists at NOAA used wind gust speeds instead of sustained wind speeds to categorize the hurricane and that only once it arrived on shore was category one sustained wind speeds registered and then only four times. That's what actually occurred at the coast of North and South Carolina coastlines was a tidal event due to an object coming from space and exerting a strong gravitational force on this region of the Earth. It is also possible that the storm was also caused by the object, but it has become clear that this storm was never as strong as it was reported to be. These objects are what I call stellar cores and are members of a system of dead stars which also contains perhaps thousands of dead planets and moons in them. These objects are attracted to the Sun and can be observed in the Sun's corona. It is the smallest of these objects that are most likely to reach the Earth, at least for now, as the Sun weakens as a result of the energy drained from these objects, larger members of this system may begin to reach Earth. Both stars and planets in the system lose their outer layers of material until the core is exposed, thus showing that there is not a big difference between stars and planets. Stars emit light from their atmospheres and have solid cores like planets. These objects have therefore lost all their outer layers and all that remains is the core of the once living planet or moon. They will therefore be solid, very dense and look somewhat like the moon. And here I show Mercury because uh, these objects would look somewhat like Mercury. The ones that are reaching Earth will most likely be smaller than Mercury though. And so planetary and moon cores reaching the Earth will be spherical and rocky and may look somewhat like Mercury, but will be much smaller. They may have a radius of perhaps 200 to 1000 miles. And uh, Mercury's core, as you can see here, this is a diagram that shows what Mercury's core is expected to look like. May also, uh, this may offer a good description of what these objects uh, may appear to uh, look like. All you have to do is imagine what Mercury would be like without all its layers of material. So not only this section uh, removed, but the whole lot uh, of the surface layers removed and that what will be left of Mercury would be its core. Mercury does have a core that seems to be larger than for other planets, but um, Mercury as a dead planet would just be its core. And these are the type of objects, um, these dead planets, that 
and moons. Because they are smaller, they may actually be moon cores that are reaching the Earth. Now, the weakest of these objects may have recently arrived in the solar system and thus have not had enough time to absorb energy from the Sun. These gravitationally weaker objects may become enveloped in a cloud of material which they draw from the Earth's atmosphere once they reach Earth. The ones in the Sun's coronal will do the same but will absorb solar coronal plasma instead. The energy absorption process then causes the material that these objects would draw from the Earth's atmosphere to heat up and become ionized. And for more details on that, you may look at Article 338 entitled The Planet X Effect, Heating and Ionization in Contact Regions. Thus, some of the objects, the weakest of them, will draw material from the Earth's atmosphere and become enveloped in a cloud of gaseous material which emits various bright colors such as magenta, which is the same as pink, red, bright orange, dark yellow, blue, pitch, etc. Bright colors. This is what is producing the sometimes very colorful clouds in our skies. These objects are sometimes also in the process of still shedding their outer layers of material and thus produce a lot of debris. Some of this debris will be in the form of dust and others will be larger pieces and look like asteroids. After gaining a certain amount of photon energy, the larger pieces will turn into asteroids and will be able to impact solar system planets. The debris in the form of dust has been entering our atmosphere for a very long time and giving rise to luminescent clouds in our atmosphere. The process seems to have begin, uh, begun in 1850 and for more details on that you may look at article 146 entitled Planet X System Time of Arrival. And here you see one of the stellar cores that has approached the Earth. This one is enveloped in a cloud of material which is emitting red light. And this, it seems quite a uh, diffuse cloud, seems to be gaseous. It most likely was gained from the Earth's atmosphere and it's become ionized. The object is emitting red light from this uh, newly acquired atmosphere. And it's the energy absorption process where the object absorbs the energy, the photon energy in this material, uh, inside the particles in the material, that leads to increase in energy and ionization, thus light emission. And here you see some of the very interesting colors that we now can see in Earth skies. This, these are not natural uh, to the Earth. Um, they are caused by the fact that the solar system has been invaded by the planet X system of stellar cores, as I like to call them. And so some of this will be caused by the objects themselves emitting this bright light, and some will be caused by the bright clouds that are created because of the dust entering the atmosphere. There is cloud condensation that occurs around these clouds. This, they absorb this material, enveloped in this material, and then there's heating and ionization that occurs because of the energy drawing process. And the ionization leads to these very bright, strange colors being uh, emitted. As you can see, these clouds actually look blue or purple. They don't look like normal clouds should look, which is either white or gray. And you can see the colors reflected here on the water too. And for more details on this, uh, and the objects that are that we have evidence have uh, been reaching Earth. You may look at Article 243 entitled Earth hosting at least three Planet X system objects. These objects make gravitational connections with the Sun in the form of gravitational vortexes. And that is what they are also doing with the Earth. This is why there was an abnormally high tide event at the east coast of the U.S. on September 14, 2018, which was covered up with 
Hurricane Florence, but an ocean recession event was also reported to have occurred some 100 miles away. And I read a comment under the video on Article 343, on uh, the first article I wrote on this, on Hurricane Florence being a cover-up, by someone uh, who lived in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And this person stated the following, Thank you for commenting on the storm. I live in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, beautiful place, just across the Ravenel Bridge in Charleston. Moved April from Myrtle. I realized we were safe here by Tuesday. We are yet to have rain, badly needed. Have tropical breezes today. The water drained between Sullivan's Island and Isle of Palms today. No water. So this comment informed me that water had drained from a region close to Mount Pleasant, and this confirmed to me that an ocean recession event had occurred in association to the high tide event. And I think uh, I'd like to thank the person who left this comment. And uh, and now the Weather Channel has also confirmed it. And here are some screenshots from the Weather Channel where we read Florence forced the water from Beach Inlet in South Carolina, leaving nothing but sand between Sullivan's Island and Owl of Palms. So these um, confirm, so the Weather Channel has confirmed that an ocean recession event had occurred about 100 miles from where the hurricane came to shore or just north of Wilmington, North Carolina. The hurricane is again used to try and cover up the fact that an ocean recession event has occurred. But the idea that a hurricane can empty a beach of water is ridiculous. This was only a category uh, one hurricane, and of course water is liquid, and therefore it has a tendency to fill a container, no matter how much you try to push it to one side. Wind produces waves, which causes the ocean level uh, or the level of the ocean to move up and down. You get crescents and troughs moving over the surface of the water. But the equilibrium position uh, can only change if gravity itself changes. This means that these objects are producing both increased and decreased gravity on the face of the Earth in the form of a diffraction pattern, and thus showing that gravity is a wave. If there have been any events in the past that have caused either increased sea levels or ocean recession, indicating a lifting or a lowering of the sea level, these must have been caused by the disruption of the Earth's gravitational field caused by another celestial object closely approaching Earth. Since this system has been invading the solar system for at least 170 years, that is, since 1850, and since they produce strong storms as well as sea level changes, it should not be surprising if events like this have occurred before. However, these events have most likely been rare, and the effects small until recently, when more of these objects, which are gravitationally stronger, started reaching Earth. And this is the diagram that I used to describe this effect before. And we'd have a stellar core, we have a bulge in the water caused by the gravitational attraction of the stellar core. And this would cause the ocean to pile up under it. It would also cause rocks to float and it will cause extreme uh, low tide levels around this uh, bulge or where the ocean has bulged up. Now the rocks uh, would float because the gravitational attraction is strongest between objects that are denser in protons. The, the gravitational force, or the strongest part of the gravitational force, is between protons. So uh, rocks are denser in protons than water, so the gravitational force between the object and the rocks would be stronger than between the water and the rocks. And that means that uh, rocks would actually be made to float, and this is how they would end up on land. And I talked about that in the previous article, Article 335. And you may also look at Article 188, uh, entitled What is Causing the Ocean to Recede All Over the World, for more details on this. Now, uh, this figure uh, is therefore how I showed this effect previously.
but I now realize that it was only partially correct. Even I was blinded by my education in this case and did not realize that such a low level change is not possible without a change in the Earth's surface gravity. The sea level at any point is set by the gravity at that point. A low sea level means that gravity has to have increased at that point. Thus the object's presence produces a decaying standing wave pattern, much like the diffraction light produces when moving through uh, an aperture, except that instead of a minimum we have a gravity reversal. We need to have a gravity reversal in order to uh, cause a, a sea level that's lower than normal, that lower than the equilibrium sea level. And this is what a circular diffraction pattern for light looks like. We have an intense uh, light at the center. We then have a minimum and then we have a second maximum where we get high intensity of light but not as high as in the center and then another minimum and so on. So this is a diffraction pattern. And here uh, we can see it in terms of the light intensity along the diameter of the diffraction pattern. You can see it's a very high for the central maximum. It's low, much lower for the second. So the wave pattern produced by gravity is similar to this. And here we can see I've measured the distance between where the ocean recession event occurred, uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, close to Mount Pleasant, and New Bern, where it was confirmed that a maximum high tide was reached of about um, 11 feet. And there's a distance of about 200 miles between the two points. This would be the radius of the diffraction pattern. So this would be the distance from here to there. It's likely that another minimum occurred on the other side. It may have gone unnoticed because maybe there was no inlet there and there would have been a, a minimum all the way around here. So this is illustrated here. So we would have this uh, circle. Uh, this would be where we'd have low gravity, so where the sea level would rise and it would be the highest at the center and the object would be above here. Um, and then there would be a minimum. The minimum is where gravity is actually reversed and where the sea level would drop instead of rise. So the sea level would drop in this region here and it would drop all the way around uh, wherever there's ocean. At the coastline, well, that, that would depend whether there is an inlet um, so that this would be observable. But even if, if it's a river, there may be drops in, uh, in the level, even in a river, if uh, this region happens to fall onto uh, a region where there's a river. So this is therefore a gravitational wave pattern similar to a diffraction pattern. And here I show it in terms of a cross section uh, underneath uh, the object. And this would be the equilibrium position of the ocean. You, you would be higher uh, just below the object. This would be the central maximum. This is where gravity is reversed. So there's higher gravity here and it causes then the sea level to drop. And if a region like this, uh, or if the object is moving along in a region like this happens to reach shore, then that will cause uh, the ocean to recede or to seem to move back out to sea. But what it is, is a low tide created by this gravitational wave generated by this object, which most likely is in the Earth's atmosphere. They do go into the Sun's atmosphere without ever touching the Sun's surface. So it's likely that they will do the same with the Earth. And then we have a column uh, of upward circulating air, and this will uh, cause a low pressure and lead to a storm being generated below the object. 
And uh, so this shows that gravity is actually a standing wave with decaying amplitude. And the amplitude is the maximum vertical distance from equilibrium. So we get a maximum amplitude here, the amplitude there, measured from the equilibrium distance uh, uh, to the bottom of uh, the trough here is lower than there so it's decaying it will be even lower with the next maximum and this will most likely carry on and with ever decaying amplitudes so um so it won't it won't be noticeable probably only these two will be noticeable the the central maximum and the minimum around it so um this leads to, uh, of course, noticeable sea level changes. And they, they will only become noticeable probably when these uh, reach a coastline. And uh, now these objects are, of course, observed in, inside the sun's corona or the sun's atmosphere, very close to the sun's surface, as I mentioned, uh, but they never touch the sun. And I explain in other articles why that is, that, that all celestial objects with a core have a positive uh, surface, positively charged surface, and they actually repel each other when they can only come as... A, they can come very close, but they never actually impact each other because uh, they, um, once inside the atmosphere, they will repel each other. And so this must therefore also uh, mean that these objects come inside the Earth's atmosphere. And they make an intense matter vortex connection drawing material from the sun's chromosphere. That's for those in the sun's corona, showing that they have an intense gravitational field, but that does not go out very far from the center of the object. The field thus behaves as the vortex created by a hole at the bottom of a water container. This is most likely because of the object's low energy status, which has uh, uh, really lowered uh, the size of its gravitational field. However, either because the object already was more energetic than other objects which have arrived at the sun's corona, or because it has gained gravitational energy by absorbing it from the sun, these objects maintain a strong residual field inside the core, arising from the photon energy inside its particles. And uh, so we see one of these stellar cores. This is most likely one that has enough gravitational energy to be able to exert a strong gravitational force on the sun. But it's a very narrow force and it causes this kind of vortex connection between the sun and the object. And through this connection, the object draws material from the sun. It's, it's uh, pulling material towards itself. And this material will be high in energy than um, the energy in its, than its particles have inside them. So this means that it's absorbing energy from the sun through this energy, through this material that it's absorbing. And these go all the way down to the chromosphere. This is actually chromosphere material. And the chromosphere seems to be liquid. So they are drawing basically uh, from the sun's oceans or the chromosphere. And this is what vortexes look like. So uh, if you have a hole at the bottom of a container, you get um, uh, these vortexes. And these are caused by a small sized gravitational attraction that occurs uh, because now uh, water is drawn through the hole towards the center of the earth. And this causes the water to spiral in into the hole. Now, uh, if the objects reaching Earth produce the same effects as those that are observed in the sun's corona, they most likely will start by producing sea level changes, but these may turn into water spouts, which would be the equivalent of the vortex as observed in the sun's corona. As the object 
uh, pull air upwards and cause it to circulate. They will also produce low pressure and thus severe storms, hurricanes over the ocean, possibly tornadoes when moving over land. The circulation is due to magnetic effects. The charged particles in the water are deflected sideways when moving through an external magnetic field, that is the Earth's magnetic field. So if it wasn't for the magnetic field, uh, water would just move in a straight line, straight down towards the hull, and the same thing would happen with this vortex. But because the sun has a magnetic field, it causes a deflection of the particles sideways, which then causes them to spiral. And so the same thing happens here, and this is actually caused by uh, the Earth's uh, gravitational field which then causes uh, matter to be pulled inwards towards the center of the Earth through this hole. Hence, gravity is a wave, which means that these objects can cause objects to be drawn upwards as well as downwards towards the ground. If an airplane flies through the region where there is a gravitational minimum, i.e. the point where gravity is reversed, created by one of these objects in the Earth's atmosphere, it will most likely be pushed towards the ground and crash. So these points where gravity is reversed, the object's gravity actually helps the Earth's gravity and makes it stronger. So as the plane moves through the region uh, of the minimum, it will suddenly become heavier. And the lifting force created by its wind speed and wingspan, which is illustrated by these two arrows here, with L's for lifting force above them. Uh, suddenly, if it moves in this region, then the gravitational attraction it will feel downwards will increase. So the plane will seem to suddenly become heavier. So the lifting force created by uh, the wingspan and its, air, its speed will not be enough to balance its weight. So of course, the airplane will nosedive into the ground. It will crash. This also means that gravity is a wave, and even the moon causes high and low tides because its gravitational influence on the Earth is in the form of a gravitational wave. In addition, this means that the gravitational field of all celestial objects will also be in the form of a wave, with high positive gravity in the center, but a shell around that where gravity is reversed and an object will be pushed outwards instead of towards the center of the object in that region. So the Earth must have at least one concentric shell inside it where gravity is reversed, and this is illustrated here. So the Earth should have a region inside it where there is positive gravity. And then it must have a shell around that, which is the minimum, where gravity is reversed. In other words, an object in here, if a tunnel could be, uh, could be made right through to the center, an object here will be attracted towards the center. But an object in the tunnel that goes through this region will actually be uh, pushed outwards towards the surface, not towards the center of the Earth because that's, that would be a shell where gravity is reversed. And this is because gravity is a wave and it produces highs and lows. In other words, positive gravity and negative gravity. So um, the fact that gravity is a wave also explains why there are only certain allowed orbits, both in macroscopic, that is astronomical systems, and microscopic systems or atoms. Therefore, the sun's nebula clouds, the electron clouds, and the planets, uh, and the planets' orbit around the sun are all a result of gravity being a wave. They are only a few certain distances from the sun where gravity is attractive or certain regions. In between, we are going to get uh, certain points where it is impossible for an object to remain in a stable orbit because it will be pushed either towards the next region of attractive gravity or uh, inwards or outwards. So this means that there will be regions um, 
uh, radial, uh, radially outwards from the Sun where uh, objects can orbit, where they can have stable orbits. And there will be regions where uh, there will be no possible um, stable orbits. So this is the, the solar capacitor, and I describe it in Article 336 entitled Stellar Nebula Cloud Structure. So the ring pattern is a manifestation of the fact that gravity is a wave. And this means that as the wind, the solar wind, comes from the sun, certain particles will settle in certain regions, giving rise to these nebula clouds as a result of gravity being a wave. So, in conclusion, gravitational waves do exist. They have always been there, right under our noses. This fact should have been realized a long time ago through observing that the Moon causes both high and low tides. A low tide, or an ocean level lower than normal, means that gravity is reduced. If this was just because water moved to somewhere else, water would flow from other parts of the ocean to fill up the hole that had been left by the water, flowing toward the high tide position under the moon. This means that all planets will have regions inside where gravity reverses, and it explains why atoms and star systems will always have allowed and forbidden orbits or energy levels. And those are the references. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.